All right, everybody. This is Michael Graham over here at Moss Lane Marine Labs. Very excited today to be doing the introduction for our um, afternoon seminar. I do have a little script here that I want to re uh, read to everyone regarding Zoom etiquette for today's seminar. Um, all participants um, will be muted throughout the seminar, so don't try to unmute yourself. Um, you won't be able to. Um, and try not to turn your video on or share your screen during the talk as well. Um, we really need to let our speaker get through their presentation before we have the opportunity to interact with them. You will have an opportunity at the end to ask questions, um, just like a normal speaker would, and we will have a moderator that will allow you to do so. Um, so once they're finished with it, once Tom's finished with his talk, just go ahead and use the raise hand feature. Um, and that just lets the moderator uh, know that you'd like to ask a question and then that'll give you an opportunity to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, if you are unable to do so and you would like to type your question into a chat, um, the moderator will have a chance to just look at that and potentially refer your question to the speaker. And then at that point, you are um, invited to turn on your video um, during the questions portions uh, to make the interaction a little bit more personal. So with that said, um, I'm very excited to um, introduce today's speaker, um, Dr. Thomas Mumford from University of Washington, Friday Harbor Labs. Um, he, when I first um, heard of Tom, I didn't actually hear his name. Um, he was referred to me as Captain Kelp. And that is a moniker that you, you keep for the rest of your life. Um, and when, uh, I'm hoping we'll see that a little bit in today's talk, but if you look into Tom's background and the role he's played, I think he really wears the Captain Kelp moniker extremely well. Um, in addition um, to being a researcher in the field um, for quite a bit of time up in the Pacific Northwest, I think many of you might know him from his interactions at Friday Harbor Labs uh, in teaching the courses there, particularly um, the marine zoology, marine botany class that he co-teaches up there. Um, there's lots of students who come to us here at Moss Landing who have taken that class um, and really have fond memories of the mixing of the two disciplines, but more importantly, Tom's incredible enthusiasm and knowledge um, in natural history as he gets those kids out in the fields. And if you just look at his title slide, um, that's probably more bull kelp than the entire state of California currently has. Um, and it's just great to see, uh, to see such a charismatic uh, critter on his screen. Um, Tom, in addition to working in the field um, for quite a bit of time, has, as you can see on his title slide, um, the, runs a program called Marine Agronomics. And that's the other interaction that I, I tend to see um, Dr. Mumford on a lot is in the role of advising, um, but also a practitioner in the field of marine aquaculture and specifically as it relates to seaweeds. Um, and so I think he, he has a very important role in the Pacific Northwest in advising um, a lot of the upcoming programs on what's worked in the past, what hasn't worked in the past, um, and what, what the future potentially holds. And so I think we can see a little bit of that in his title today, um, in which he's talking about the past, present, and future of kelp in Washington. And it's just very exciting to be able to get his perspective so early in our semester um, and something for us all to think about. So Tom, we welcome you here, and we're very excited to hear what you got to say. Great, thank you. Great to be here. Um, thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to talk and catch up and kind of bring what we're doing up here in Washington State down to California a little bit and talk about some of the interactions there. Um, fair warning here, my internet is painfully slow. And if this delay business gets too much, uh, Laura's gonna jump in and, and, and take over from showing the slides down there, but hopefully this will work. Um, so I want to talk a bit about the past, the present, and a little bit about the future of where we're going with, with kelp in the state of Washington. Um, I want to give some thanks to Helen Berry, uh, who works with the Washington Department of Natural Resources, which, from which I retired uh, about 10 years ago. And Helen has had a lot of input into this talk, and a lot of the data we're going to show actually comes from work that I started, and she's very adeptly carried on here. So those are all this. Um, a little bit about me, and then I'm going to turn my screen off here. Interestingly enough, um, my world of psychology, not as Captain Kelp, but just psychology in general, started at that other marine station, which is across the bay there, um, 1965. I came out as an undergraduate and took the marine botany course from Izzy and Uncle George. And after that, it kind of went from there. 
so I've been kind of involved in seaweed basically my, my whole career and done all sorts of fun things, some of which you'll see here today. Uh, and today I, I continue to sort of have fun. I say fun because I love it, teaching in places like Friday Harbor. So, so I'm going to turn off my video, get a little more bandwidth here. Um, hopefully you can all still see this thing. Um, let's see what happens here. Um, this is going to work or not. Um, locked up right from the get-go here. No, we're not. There we go. So um, a lot of different kinds of kelp uh, in, in California as well as Washington. This is just a sort of a, a smattering of photographs of the different types that we've got up here. Um, interestingly enough, very recently, a um, woman down in California, uh, Maria Dingledine, made this um, poster, and I helped her with this a little bit, be anatomically correct, as they say, um, showing that basically we've got 22 or 23 different species, and I say about of kelp, and this poster shows the varieties that we've got here. Um, this was a little bit of a rat hole that I went down. Uh, so here's a list of the species of kelp that are found in the state of Washington, and also the ones that are in California. And so we've got about 23, and I say about because there's some fuzzy edges like all oh, taxonomy, and there's roughly 21. I think the main thing here is that there's a big overlap in, in the species that we find here. Uh, there are a few that are here that aren't down there, and in fact, there are more, things like Cymotheria and Agarum. Um, the one that probably is most interesting from my standpoint is the fact that Saccharina latissima, which is probably one of the more, is the dominant subtitle non-floating kelp is not found in California, which is very interesting. And it's found in the warmer parts of this part of the world. We've got uh, here one introduced um, species. Um, it's debatable whether it's a kelp or not anymore. This is the Cordaria asiatica. Uh, that kind of looks like a shoelace. Um, and you've got Ungaria, which we don't have up here yet. But the time will probably come uh, that that in fact will happen. So the overlap is, is, is pretty high here between these two groups. So a lot of remarkable similarity. The one thing to point out here is that there's a fair number of issues with some of these subtitle species and the identification of these and their distributions. Uh, we know a lot about the floating kelp, the macrocystis, the uh, nereocystis, but we know remarkably little about, and we'll talk more about this, about the subtitle kelp. And one thing to think about most of these is that what's gonna happen with these species and their distributions uh, with global warming. Uh, in particular, notice that there's at least these marks on here. There is uh, uh, the Icenia, the laminary forloia, and dentidra down here that are interesting in that they occur in California. They also occur in British Columbia and Alaska, but they don't occur here. So what about that distribution? What's going to happen when things warm up, continue to warm up here? So we've got a lot of different kinds of kelp, uh, lots of different uh, species. The one that I really miss, uh, you'll see a picture of me here, is the Pelagiophycus, which uh, doesn't occur up here, but I was utterly delighted when I've seen it down in that in your part of the world. So the name game is all, all well and good. And Robin Kimmerer has a great quote in her, her book, which I love, The Breeding Sweetgrass. And she said, I had a quote in there about, yes, I have learned the names of all the bushes, but I have yet to learn their songs. And this kind of comes down to, it's not what you really look at that matters, it's what you see. So I want to tell a little bit about the songs, a little bit about these things, not just what their names are. We can argue endlessly about names, but names is not really where the good story is, is it now? So, the whole world have been around for a very long time. And I just want to acknowledge here that kelp has been a traditional food and a really source of materials since time immemorial for all these West Coast First Nations and tribes. And I want to acknowledge and give thanks to those who have cared for and managed and have been sustained not only by these seaweeds, but by all the rich gifts of the sea, guided by the generations of their ecological knowledge keepers, 
and recognizing that we now have much to learn and we need to rethink our approach. And to get there, we need to respect and acknowledge all the injustices of the past and the present while learning and practicing a demonstrated sustainable way of, to the future. So I wanna go into this talk in the spirit of all of us being in the same canoe. Let us paddle forward together. So this is a carving of Kuala Lut, who reminds us of a story about the relationships of humans to one another, love, and to kelp, and the ecosystem dependent upon that kelp. Um, you'll notice that her hair is bull kelp, and the long, there's a long and wonderful story, and we'll talk a little bit about it. If you hear, I'll give a link later on to the Samish Nation's story map, which tells the whole story in, in a wonderful way and, and makes that link. So the first nation of uh, Native American indigenous people here had lots of different ways that they use kelp for a variety of reasons. And <clears throat> when the Europeans showed up in the late 1700s and in the end of the 1800s, um, kelp had a little different way of being dealt with. And I think most of you have probably seen this in the maps in the state of California, because that's kind of where it started. This is a map of Whidbey Island up here in Puget Sound. And if you look carefully, here's the land mass up here that there on the shore are these little sort of branch uh, symbologies here. And this is kelp. This is kelp that was very carefully mapped by in all these early charts and early maps, not only here, but in California as well. Turns out that they figured out pretty quickly that if it was there was kelp, it was pretty shallow and that indicated shallow water and you didn't really want to be sailing or running a boat in there. So there was even this is this map is 1871, which is a very early map for this part of the world up here, the same in California. So these some of the kelp mapping of where kelp was dates back I don't know, years or so here now, which is pretty remarkable. Um, this is another depiction of this on the maps, but she'll point this out to you. This is what's different about this part of the world. And you'll notice that this is just a little tiny band of kelp that's marked, marked along the side of one of these islands. You could probably throw a rock across the width of these beds. They're very narrow. And there's a lot of beds like this. And we'll come back to where these are and what's happened to them here in a, in a little bit. <clears throat> Next sort of big mapping of where is kelp in Washington effort was actually done is interesting and it occurred in California as well. Um, prior to World War I, there was an effort to try to figure out where to get potash, which was a fertilizer and then also used for making gunpowder. World War I was looming and there was a big effort to map all the kelp on the West Coast. And this is a, a, a photograph or a, a picture of one of the maps that was done uh, early in 19, 1912 with rowboats uh, showing these colored sort of sausages that were the beds where they found uh, the, the kelp. And the colors indicated whether it was a dense bed or a, or a not so dense bed and so forth. We go back and use these actually quite a bit, but you have to be a bit careful with these because they made these bands wide enough to see on a map. They were sort of cartoons almost. And they're actually more interesting about how long the bed was, not necessarily how wide the bed was. A number of other sort of kelp maps were made all during the early 1900s. Of the, but the next sort of big statewide effort up here about where kelp was or the floating kelp was done by what we call the shore zone inventory. And this was done in the mid 19. 90s to about 2000, in which we flew Megan to Tierra and then a helicopter over all the sound and videotaped in the map, all the shoreline here. And this shows a couple of different things I want to show you. One is that there's a quite a bit of non-floating and floating kelp found throughout the state of Washington here. So the Columbia River is down here, uh, the mouth of the, uh, down in this part of the world down here. Um, the Strait of Juan de Fuga, Vancouver Island, Seattle and here, this one called Puget Sound or the Salish Seas up through this area here. And in particular, uh, up in the northern part of the state of Washington, there's a lot of kelp, both floating and non-floating kelp here. Two things I want to point out. One, a couple of things. One is that there's a wide variety of different kinds of shoreline here in Washington. The northern part in the San Juans up here, 
many of these areas are uh, similar to uh, areas that we see in California and the outer coast where the rocky shorelines uh, and the kelp can be extensive and there's a lot of floating kelp, but it's a rocky shoreline. Starting in Whidbey Island and all down through the, the rest of Puget Sound here, it is um, glacial outwash. And these are um, non-consolidated um, gravelly beaches. And this area down here, this is a typical band of, of eelgrass, or kelp, I should say, eelgrass, for goodness. Uh, near your sister, it's very narrow, very narrow bed. This is in the Tacoma area, same kind of a thing, not a very broad band. Here's an aerial drone shot of one of these beds down here, not very thick, um, quite, quite thin, but they're here. So 11% of the state has got floating kelp on it. 31% has non-floating kelp on it. And actually between the two of those, there's even more. But the other interesting thing to think about here in Puget Sound is there's 4,800 kilometers of shoreline. If you start walking down here in the Columbia River and walk all this shoreline, go all around the islands and everywhere and end up here in, in Blaine and Canada, that's about 3,000 miles. And you've got 5,500 kilometers in the state of California. So there's not quite as much, but still a considerable amount of shoreline uh, here in Washington. And again, a great deal of that has, um, has, has kelp on it. So more recently, we've been undergoing, and, and there's been a, a wide variety of efforts here in trying to figure out where kelp canopy, this is the floating nereocystis and macrocystis occurs. Um, which we'll a little bit more about this in a moment, but we've got um, diverse data sets. Um, and a couple of things we want to be doing here is that we want to maximize the extent of where we're looking for kelp and also to try to be consistent over time. And we'll talk about why you want to be consistent when you can imagine you want to try to be able to compare things over a period of time. So if you look at these blue areas, we've flown that area using aerial photography since 1989. So that's over 30 years now that we've been monitoring floating kelp in this area that's shown in the turquoise here. The Samish uh, tribe has been doing aerial photography and other efforts here in the San Juan Islands. And then there was a number of sites down here in South Sound that have been monitored as, repeatedly uh, using kayaks by the Department of Natural Resources. And then we'll talk a bit more about these purple triangles, which are ones that are the Marine Resource Committees, which have been used uh, to, uh, for citizen science, if you will. So here's a slide showing how this 1989 to the present worked, this area of photography. This was done by Bob Van Wagen, and he's actually done quite a bit of work down in California. And it involved him coming up here in a small plane, leaning out the window essentially with a uh, large format color infrared camera. So he took both true color, near vertical aerial photographs, and here's a, a kelp bed that's around a point here in, in, um, in one of the Fuca. Here's what it looks like in color infrared. And then he would classify this and get both the canopy area and then the entire bed itself and give these back to us. <clears throat> and say we've got this every year, except for 1993. Uh, we've got the whole Strait of Juan de Fuca and the Outer Coast map using a very consistent methodology. Um, we're probably gonna phase out of this in the sense that sort of we've gone into digital now uh, but we're looking at other ways of accomplishing the same thing and yet trying to maintain the consistent data. If you want to see the data in action, you can go to the Department of Natural Resources uh, Nearshore website. But there's also at this particular in, um, site here, a great story map that allows you to look at the historical on this side. And then here's the more recent uh, data from these uh, aerial photographs. And it's one of these tricky deals where I'm not going to do it live, but you can pull the slider back and forth and, and compare historical to current and also to how many years this kelp has been occurring in these different areas here. It's a really a great data set. <clears throat> so there's a story map that goes with that that you can look at. That's, that's really fun. Um, the other story map and the one that actually tells the story about um, the uh, uh, traditional uses and traditional knowledge comes from the uh, uh, Samish tribe uh, in Anacortes. And this is a really interesting um, effort because it involves not only current mapping 
but an enormous amount of information gathered from tribal elders, tribal fishermen, um, and incorporating not just sort of the science of you know, remote sensing and so forth, but the vast amount of knowledge that was within that tribe about where there was kelp, what was the kelp good for, what kind of fishing was involved with the kelp, uh, and sort of the value and, and how it interacted with uh, members of that tribe. So it's a, it's a great story map. Uh, and I would encourage you to take a look at that as well. The other, I'm trying to get my pointer back in the right spot here. Um, interesting effort that's been going on has been one that's been done by the Marine Resource Committees, which is a, a, a county-based citizen science um, group that works under the umbrella of the Northwest Straits Commission. And about uh, in the early 2000s, we came up with a kayak-based survey protocol for basically getting people in kayaks with GPS units to go around and map bull kelp beds, in this particular case, in this area, and then get these data back into a uh, GIS. And again, if you want to see these data, um, there's the Sound IQ, which is this uh, through the city of Bellingham, but all their data is, is, is presented in this particular um, um, database. The fun thing and the, and the most interesting thing to me is we've been working a lot with these groups who are all local citizens, Clallam County, Watkin County, so forth. Each of them got a little different spin on things, but working them with them on what we call actions to impacts. So you went out and you monitor these kelp beds. How can you use these data to help inform local planners? Uh, people doing setting up reserves, uh, people doing different kinds of actions and, and policy making uh, within the county and also the state level. So there's this whole effort to take this citizen science information and turn it into something that actually makes a difference to them, makes a difference in their local communities. Uh, and they're having a great time with it. Each county has got a little different spin on it. Uh, you can go in and look at some of these things, but it's working. Uh, so it's not just a matter of, oh, here's some fun activities on a Sunday afternoon going on in a kayak. They're actually doing something with this. The other thing that's going on here with uh, all these inventory data is that the Puget Sound um, uh, partnership has what they call vital signs. And this is a statewide effort. You can see all the different kinds of things here. There's human populations and water quality and quality of life and species and then habitat. They've just added a um, um, new indicator, which is basically canopy kelp and kelp, kelp coverage. And so there's just the beginning now of setting up the sound wide framework that will tell us how we are doing with this. And it's gonna be based on the work that we started in about 2000 with eelgrass. And it is basically a probabilistic eelgrass uh, type of monitoring in which you segment the shorelines, you go out and use underwater video and these other techniques to get the surface and subsurface uh, kelp. And then you can begin to look at what's the difference in the change, what's the change in the amount of kelp over a certain period of time with, and you have a defined statistical certainty or accuracy that you want with this thing. So what the goal is to say how much is coming or going over what period of time and what certainty can you add to that. The statewide level, at the same time, trying to have particular um, sites that you are consistently monitoring, not probabilistic, but actually you're doing year after year. So it's this blend of both the statewide probabilistic sampling as well as a uh, single site monitoring. But the other fun thing about this is that there's a whole bunch of partners working on this thing. It's not just a single agency or a single group that's doing it. It's going to involve tribes. It's going to involve UW and researching, researchers at the University of Washington, a variety of state and federal agencies, as well as the Northwest Straits Commission and the Marine Resource Committees and these kinds of people all working together. So this is not just um, sort of a single effort kind of a thing. There's a, a wide variety of of people that will be uh, involved in this. <laughs> so 
that's kind of some of the highlights of what we've been doing on where is the kelp. And this is just sort of a my view of what's coming up next. What, where, where are we headed with all this kind of thing? And what's becoming very obvious is that this sort of integration of techniques and integration of different groups of people working together is really where we're headed. And so we're going to be integrating information from satellites, uh, fixed wing kinds of uh, information gathering, drones, boat-based people put putting around in, in boats, divers, uh, ROVs, underwater video surveys, all these different techniques. And the big trick here is, and that I can't emphasize for those of you ever doing monitoring, what specific research and management questions are you trying to answer? How will this, this monitoring information be used? Which in, will drive, actually, how all the information is generated. So you, it's, a, it's not just, here's a bunch of kelp information, have fun. It's what are the questions that you're asking of this information, and then making that applicable and relevant to and timely for the questions that are being asked. Often that gets overlooked in my experience. Um, we're trying to maximize the extent, so we're doing statewide. We're not just looking at one particular place. And again, it's gonna involve a lot of different data sets. Um, one of the priorities is to be consistent over time within certain locations. Again, there's this sort of overall picture and then there's this site-specific, time-specific question. That will answer different questions, whether they be research or management questions. Uh, again, we talked about this probabilistic monitoring, um, vital signs from the canopy kill. And the big thing that I'm pushing right now, and I think is really important, we've spent an enormous amount of time because it's fairly simple and there's a long data set for those two species of floating kelp. But we've not got a very good handle on is the subtitle species. The other 21 or 20 some odd non-canopy forming species, where are they? Are they coming, are they going? What's their, what's their distribution? Uh, what changes are we seeing with those? We don't know very much at all. It's really kind of almost, I'll say sad, but it's, um, it, it's, some, it's the next big effort. The other thing is, of course, is that the, we'll be working a lot of different collaborations and, and two that involve you folks down here in California are the kelp mappers and the kelp watch. And um, we just had a meeting the other day with the kelp watch people and working on, with them on, this is basically satellite data and then the kelp mappers have got a variety of different kinds of things, primarily in Northern California. So we began to sort of collect and bring together the different kinds of information uh, that we've got, not just in the state of Washington or BC or Alaska, but all up and down the coast. So we've got some of these data. Let's talk a little bit about what it's telling us. And there are some interesting things that can come out of this. And a great deal of this information uh, is stuff that Helen Berry has taken and put together uh, out of the information that we started a long time ago, but Helen has been the the primary person sort of making it, um, making the, making it basically telling a story, let's put it that way. So again, looking along those, that open coast and along the Strait of Juan de Fuca in that 1989 data set from aerial photography, we found that basically you can look at the neurocystis and macrocystis curves here, purple and, and the black, and they vary over the different years. Uh, but they're pretty pretty variable, but the trick is that they're very linked to climate. And basically the Pacific decadal oscillation, warm versus cool, same story you know in California. Uh, the, the kelp comes and goes and it's very, very linked to the water temperature and those particular kinds of things. The thing that is interesting is that on the open coast, at least, we've not seen any huge major changes over the last 100 years or so, it appears. There's been no dramatic changes in that part of the world. Um, the other part that I think needs people in California in particular need to pay, pay attention to, and people will think about kelp and sea otters a lot. And in Northern California, that's a hot topic at the moment. Uh, and I always felt wrote a paper here that looked very carefully at these kelp data and then at how they related to the abundance of um, sea otters and also the abundance of um, major uh, other things such as urchins and crabs and so forth. And found that the 
canopy abundance was, was positively correlated with sea otter population is kind of the, the classic trophic cascade story, you know, more otters, more kelp. But then about 2000, things didn't do that anymore. It kind of decoupled. The otter population kept going, uh, kept increasing, but the kelp really didn't seem to be increasing along with it. They, and the word he used was decoupled. And so his idea is that other factors may be as or more important in influencing community dynamics out there now uh, than the otters. And I think this is something that there's gonna be a lot more work done on. And I think about Northern California in particular uh, and the otters and the otters in the Central Coast. And so it, it, the story is complicated, let's put it that way, I think is what you can say now. Um, so you've got, there's a new management trade-offs in those habitats. You know, uh, that we may want to be thinking about. The other really interesting story that we've kind of unraveled here is this business about um, the marine heat wave. The marine heat wave that hit and decimated the kelp in Northern California in 2013, 2014, shown here. Um, and if you look at these uh, these charts, they're uh, the uh, the yellow area here is when, the, when we had the marine heat wave. And again, if you look at the orange lines here, um, this is the orange coastline is, is equivalent to this uh, bottom line here. The, the straight is the purple line here. And you'll see a pretty significant decrease in, in that 2013, 2014 period of time. It hurt, it hurt. But interestingly enough, along the outer coast of the straits, it popped back pretty well, that the following year, it popped back pretty well. And we had a pretty good recovery of those populations and, and they've stayed recovered, okay? If you come in a little bit further, however, you start looking at Smith and Minor and Cypress Island, you'll notice that it was about a year later that things recovered. There was a delay in that recovery. And then if you start going to places like Cherry Point, it was even longer than that, it was a couple of years before it started to recover and it has recovered. Now, that's an interesting um, thing to think about. However, even scarier than that though, is what we're seeing in the inner basins of the Salish Sea. So if you keep going down further south in the Salish Sea and Puget Sound, or you go north in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, uh, in the Strait of Georgia, up in the northern, up, up in the northern part of the Strait of, uh, Strait of Georgia, you're seeing that that decline was only part of the picture, and there has been no recovery. Basically, it declined and has not recovered. And what the story we've been working on, Helen and I've been working on here, and there's a paper we've got out on this, that basically the historical extent of bull kelp in southern Puget Sound with these uh, areas where it's either um, the maximum historical extent was where it's uh, both turquoise and uh, the pink here. Lots and lots of it. And there's areas where it's never been, re been recorded. The most recent is only where there are high currents in these areas where it's purple. All the area that is turquoise has been lost. 80% of the bull kelp in South Puget Sound has been lost. It's only still really common around here where there's high currents and also high currents here. We'll talk about the, why we think that is. Um, trying to find the next slide here. The thing that's interesting and different from the situation that we have, at least in Northern California, was that these declines have been going on very early. They basically, the maximum amount was in the 1870s when we first started having these maps. It's been on a slow, gradual, chronic, not good decline ever since. No dramatic decline in any one time, nor any recovery. It just is, the slope has been a nice straight down. And you can start looking at these uh, maps here, uh, dividing up the west, um, area over here versus the central part of this area versus the east. 
And again, looking at when these declines occurred, and you'll notice that a lot of these occurred way back when, prior to 1960. Um, so it's not a simple matter of, of a heat wave in 2013 in, in these particular cases. <clears throat> An interesting aspect or way to look at this thing was some work that Sam Starko just has published about the wave shelter shorelines. And we started looking at this out in Bamfield and, and in Berkeley Sound, and basically found that it seems that the kelp losses that he could see <coughs> were particularly sensitive in areas that had <coughs> were wave sheltered that didn't have a lot of water motion. Hang on a minute here. And as indicated here, um, there's a lot of <coughs> wave shelter shorelines in these where he's seen these particular kinds of things going on. So again, <coughs> if you look at the same map <coughs> and you look over here, you begin to see the wave height versus the currents. And then you begin to look at where we've seen these losses. The losses are all the purple areas down here that have not much wave height nor much in the way of currents. And then you begin to look at temperature and dissolved inorganic nitrogen curves in these areas. And if you look at the purple area, this is the easier areas in here with lower currents, lower wave action versus the purple, I mean, the turquoise one here narrows that it's high current, high wave action, that <clears throat> these are averages, not, not um, these, these are average or means, I should say, not extremes, but the extremes are much higher. And they're in the, the winters are roughly the similar, similar in the winter time, but the summer temperatures get much higher in these areas down in, in here. Ditto, where you get stratification and you get very low nitrogen levels in the southern areas where you get well mixed areas where you don't see those extremes up in where it's as mixed as this. <clears throat> and you start correlating these curves to where you see recruitment failures uh, in the lab uh, with both sporophytes and um, gametophytes. And we're starting to push things. And these are only means. These are not extremes. The extremes are up in the, up in the, in the south sound here. The extremes are up in the 20s. Uh, so we, we, we think temperature combination with these uh, nitrogen levels are part of the problem here. So we don't have a whole lot of information about the really good effects of the short-term extremes, nor do we know much about what I want to call the synergistic effects of temperature and nitrogen in this part of the world. So again, this is sort of a bigger picture here map. These losses not only have occurred, but we're beginning to now quantify all these areas up in here in the central part of Puget Sound, in Seattle area, Edmonds area, or again, you're seeing loss turquoise and the only remaining ones are the pink here. Losses throughout Puget Sound here. So what are the stressors? Temperature, I hate to say it, is probably a big one. Uh, nutrients may be combined with that. They're ameliorated or influenced by winds and currents. We don't know much about herbivores and such as urchins and kelp crabs, but they're probably part of the picture as well. The big thing that I keep coming back and harping about is that, as you all know, kelp has its life history. An obligate life history has to go through a gametophyte stage. We know remarkably little about the gametophytes in nature. We know quite a bit about them sort of the lab situation, but we know very little about where they are, how long lived they are, and what influences them in, in nature, if you will. Uh, so that's a huge area that's beginning to really be well investigated but it's just getting started. And the other thing as I mentioned before, we know all these stories about the, the uh, canopy form kelp, in this particular case, bull kelp, but we don't know much about this, what's happening to the subprime kelp. So this was, this precipitated, these losses beginning to get people's attention. People were starting to think and then look about this, and go, wait a minute, we've got some problems going on here in Puget Sound. And, at the same time, the rockfish people at NOAA listed two different species of rockfish in Puget Sound, and because they were pretty much gone. And they went back and did their, uh, their environmental review of this, 
And lo and behold, juvenile settlement habitats that were considered to be critical habitat, all were kelp in this particular case, all kinds of kelp, not just floating kelp, but all the kelp. And so in order to write their recovery plan, they needed to figure out what are they going to do with kelp. And so they funded and we worked, I was in part of this effort, worked for two years uh, for the Puget Sound Kelp Conservation and Recovery Plan. And this was again aimed primarily uh, for recovery of rockfish, but we took a broad view of this whole thing. And this was a great paper and it's very similar to and uh, has a lot of the same attributes as the one that you guys did for the Fairlands, for the, um, uh, the Marine Sanctuary in the Fairlands, which includes Northern California. So if you want to take a look at this thing, here's the link to it. It has an executive summary. It's got the main body of the paper, but it also has Appendix A, which is a really good, big kelp knowledge review. It's a good summary of the literature. And really interestingly was we had our Appendix B, which is the cultural importance of kelp, which is a really fascinating, did a lot of really good homework. And so what was the cultural importance of kelp, particularly with the tribes? And it's the, probably the best account of all that that we've got. So we had some strategic goals that came out of this. Uh, one was to understand and to reduce the kelp stressors. So the understand is the, is the key word here. Deepen the understanding of the value of kelp to Puget Sound ecosystem, and then to integrate that knowledge into an understanding into the management. Uh, we wanted to look more of the kelp distribution and trends, which we've talked a little bit about here. Uh, we needed to designate it or designate kelp protected areas, uh, look at restoring kelp forests, so the restoration effort coupled with this, and then finally to promote awareness, engagement, and action from basically everybody. Uh, I'm going to say that I'm part of number six right here today as I'm talking to you. Um, so this is one of the slides that, that um, I came up with. And this slide is very slow in getting there. So I, I took these things and I said, what can we do? And I put quotes around we, because I was aiming this thing at students, at researchers, at government agencies, at tribal members, at citizen scientists, fishers, you name it. We is everybody. I, I did not stop with uh, just aiming this at you know, one particular group here. And so this understanding reducing stressors, basically when we figure out what they are, uh, all of us are gonna be involved in that. And to be really honest, I'm looking at things like temperature, global warming, that's not gonna be solved, particularly in the state of Washington or probably even the state of California, it's a global problem. And we're all gonna take all of us, not really everybody, gonna to have to work on that one all together to make that turn around and happen. Um, so the understanding of the value of kelp ecosystems, anybody who knows into management, just as a couple of examples here, um, Friday Harbor Labs, we've got some money, um, and uh, Brooke Weagle has been hired as a postdoc, and we're beginning to look at and thinking about the, uh, the stressors, what kind of stressors are we got, particularly how the gametophytes, and we're looking also, Robin Fails and others looking at temperature effect on sporophytes, other people looking at effects of things like kelp crab. Uh, so there's a bunch of research going on to try to understand the value of kelp and what those stressors are. Really interesting study that just started. The Pew Trust came in and funded a study to look at the what kinds of legal protections are there under critical area ordinances and uh, all these different laws, if you will, protecting habitats. What are the laws? How are they being enacted? Are they and are they effective? And if then they are not being enacted or not being carried out, or if they're not effective, what needs to be done? So this is beginning to look very look, peering up under the rug a little bit and looking and seeing we've got some laws in the books. What's really going on? Is it making a difference or not? And so this is beginning to link and integrate into management in a very different and interesting way. Um, we've talked about this at the beginning of the talk, quite a bit of the kelp distribution and trends. 
again, DNR, Ellen Berry and so forth, uh, kind of leading the charge on a lot of this. Samish Indian uh, Nation is working with this. Um, he's just become the Lower Elwha Clown Tribe. And then also this Marine Resource Committees are, are being funded. So there's a variety of people working on this uh, distribution of trends. Protected areas is an interesting one. The Department of Natural Resources has got a number of aquatic reserves, but I think the thing that I would point out, and people may hear this, is that there are a lot of protected areas, but they don't necessarily protect kelp and they don't necessarily manage for what we think of the stressors. So you may have a reserve that says we're protecting kelp, but that reserve doesn't necessarily overlap and protect or think about fisheries or about water quality. So there's this mishmash of things that are protected, but they're not well coordinated. And this, I think, is going back up to this effort about how do you protect kelp? Well, you might look at reserves and have a little more coherent management um, effort in those kinds of things. The Restoring Kelp Forest, there's a number of people working on this now. The main one is the Puget Sound Restoration Fund, Betsy Peabody and so forth have been uh, funding or working on this. Port of Seattle is beginning to look very seriously at this uh, and a number of the tribes. Um, so there's 15 treaty tribes and a number of them are looking at uh, restoring kelp forests. Um, and finally, just awareness and engagement to pump things up a little bit. Um, we got a million and a half dollars in the state budget starting last June. Um, so Senator Office uh, was a sponsor for this. Two years for a million and a half bucks. A number of this has gone into the uh, uh, Party Harbor Labs, the tribes, and also restoration efforts, and a number of different things here. And I can provide more information about that if you want to get into it. Um, there is a kelp research and monitoring working group uh, that Helen Berry is spearheading, and that meets quarterly and just talking about what's going on and coordinating and so forth. Um, there's a state of the Sailor Sea report that Western Washington just put out that looks carefully at sort of the overall picture for uh, kelp and all the other resources. The Puget Sound uh, Restoration Fund just did a great fun thing in our, another slide on what they call the kelp expedition. We'll talk about that in a minute. We've already talked about this vital sign of the kelp canopy business here. So these are some of the things that are going on here. Um, if I were to step back, Captain Kelp and all his infinite wisdom here. <laughs> and what's my wish list on, on some of these things that you might want to look at? And this is appropriate, I think, for people like you folks at the uh, Marine Station here in the academic world a bit more. Think about all 23 species. Don't think just about bull kelp or don't think just about macrocystis. There's a lot of other things out there that, in terms of just kelp, that are really important. And you might actually then start thinking about turf species and all these different interactions coralline algae and so forth. Think about the whole life cycle, folks. Don't, don't get hung up on the floating gametophytes. sporophytes. I mean, there are gametophytes out there. What are they doing? Where are they? Where's the break in the in this cycle? Is the is, is the are the problems where in this cycle are the problems? And then so you look at the stressors and you think about both sporophytes and gametophytes. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done on this, what I'm calling the provisioning of ecosystem goods and services. You know, what are the real values and, and interactions on habitat? And the one that's becoming very important now, people are getting really perked up about, is just food web support. And that has to do with how much kelp carbon goes into the food web, <clears throat> how much carbon sequestration, what kinds of things are being supported by kelp carbon, if you will. We're beginning to think very seriously about germplasm banking and genetic studies. And there's a number of that in California. Uh, Felipe Alberto in Milwaukee, of all funny places, is working on that in California. He's um, in Milwaukee, as I said. Um, a lot of interesting work needs to be done, I think, more on the carbonate cycling. So we have pH, ocean education, carbon sequestration, a lot of those things not well understood uh, at this point. And we're also beginning to understand that the kelp microbiome is probably really critical in most of these things and maybe underlying a lot of issues that we're seeing in terms of losses. And again, we're just beginning to understand that. And frankly, the big question that kind of overarches all this stuff is what are we going to do with climate change? How, how's that going to play into all this? 
just a few thoughts about kelp restoration while we're kind of finishing up here. Um, I'm a firm believer, if you're gonna do restoration, that you need to fix the problem that led to the loss before you start getting really serious about restoring. You, you, you need to, you don't just put kelp out there, you need to figure out why did it go away, fix that, and then it may come back all by itself, but certainly you've got a better whack at restoring things. It needs to be ecosystem based. You can't just look at kelp. You need to look at the whole thing. You look at the herbivores, the interactions, competitive interactions, all these different things when you're looking at this. And I'm really hot on the fact that if you're going to do put out stuff and do restoration efforts, design them in such a way that if they succeed or fail, that you know why. It wasn't like you come back a year later and say, oh, it didn't work, or it did work. Why did it work? Or why didn't it work? You need to really, really, and that takes a lot of very clever interactions on an experimental level. <clears throat> My second principle is don't lose in the first place. Do everything you can in terms of conservation, protection, and don't have to end up at the end of the rope trying to bring it back. The other one that's becoming more interesting is this whole thing about setting the goals. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to restore something to you know, 1850? Are you trying to reorganize it into a different kind of ecosystem? Or are you trying to restore something that may be more resilient in the face of global warming? And those are big goal questions that need to be thought through. It's not just simple enough to say, <coughs> we're going to fix book help. I think there's more to it than that. Um, the other thing to think about here in the state of Washington is that the permitting and the long-term right of entry ability to stay in a place with restoration has been difficult. And I don't know about how it is in California, but up here, it's a battle to get the permits and then it's a battle to say, if I do all this effort about restoration, is it gonna stay there or are you gonna come in and do something else in that area? <clears throat> so there's a big uh, sort of legal permitting hassle that goes with all this. I would ask the question is most of the efforts up here at least have been focused on neurocystis. I think that's true in Northern California as well. Is that really what you're trying to restore? Is that, is that the goal? And then the restoration, I think in the long run, is going to do a lot of germ banking and genetic studies. Are we going to end up start looking at species or strains that are heat tolerant or disease resistant or ones that are resistant to herbivory. We're gonna start looking at, at manipulating these uh, restoration species in such a way that may make them more resilient. Just to point out, and I wanted to just fill this in here because it's I think the whole picture is, seaweed harvesting in the state of Washington, basically there's no commercial harvest in the state of Washington, uh, with the exception of you can do it for uh, hair roll, but there's no hair roll fishery. So basically there's no commercial harvest. There's a 10 pound wet weight personal use limit now, and you need a license to do that. And to be honest, it's not well enforced, except probably in state parks. Uh, but on the other hand, there's, as we can tell, no large scale commercial harvesting going on here. Just to point out this other one, this awareness thing, we had a great expedition, kelp expedition, in which we you can kind of see here, go to the story map, because it tells the whole thing in absolutely great detail. This is a beautiful story map. Um, basically started, and, and we met for over a week, and met with different researchers, different interest groups, fishers, tribes, uh, people doing inventories and so forth, at all these different six sites, and ended up down here in Olympia. Um, and, looked at all the different aspects of kelp, kelp conservation, kelp awareness, involved a lot of media and so forth. It was, it was really fun. I was involved in the last day down here in Olympia and the whole thing, the absolute high point of the whole trip for me was this one sign. When have you ever been to somewhere where they had a sign where the kelp could park? And I just I always look at that and laugh. Uh, it was for the, all the people coming to that particular event, but that was the sign they made <laughs> for the event. Park over here at Kelp. I also want to just measure, there's not a lot going on with kelp aquaculture up here in the state of Washington. Um, we're looking at this as what I'm calling a four-step process. You need to do this gaining the trust, the social license building. You permit, you can actually then farm and produce the seaweed, and then you do the kelp 
um, marketing of whatever it is, and it also involves kelp. But right now, there's only one relatively small farm. Uh, this is the Blue Dot Sea Farms over here in Hood Canal. And other than that, we've got several groups investigating, looking at permits, but we don't have any big kelp farms like in Alaska or BC uh, in the state of Washington. And lastly here, just to think a little bit about all this cooperation and coordination, we've got a bunch of different efforts here. The Community of Practice, this Washington Sea Grant, uh, Meg Chadsey's leading up that effort. Uh, as again, I mentioned Helen Berry has got this group, Kelp Research and Monitoring. But the point I made at that Kelp Expedition and the one that, um, that I wanted to bring out here to everybody for, it, it's delightful to me is in that Kelp has engendered what I'm gonna call new uh, developments and resource management. It has made people stop and think much more about an ecosystem approach to resource management. You don't manage just kelp. You need to manage the ecosystem and all the different things it interacts with. People are beginning to really catch on to that for the first time. It's not just about salmon, putting salmon eggs out. Um, there's more to it than that. And the second part is that there's been enormously in the kelp expedition really showed the operation and coordination between these two. And I have this theory about much of the resource management up here has been, I want to call it contentious. You think about salmon, you think about shellfish, you think about, there's usually some pushing and shoving that's going on about how you manage these resources. Kelp kind of has flown under the radar on a lot of this. And it's been really fun and enlightening and delightful that people actually come together about how to manage kelp without all the baggage or with less baggage than there has been in the past. And this has been really refreshing, hopeful uh, development in all this. So we start talking about um, this international coordination, how do, we, how, do we, how do we do this kelp recovery? And I think we've got a great start. We've got this Puget Sound Conservation as a framework for action. And a lot of what we're doing now is within that framework. So we've got some kind of a game plan, if you will. To, to, to do this. And I made a vow, we all made a vow that this conservation plan wasn't gonna just be shelf art. We actually were gonna do it and we are doing it. So the next question I have to ask is how are we interact with California? And I hope to have some discussions with non this thing. How do we interact with the bull kelp recovery plan that's one of the Mendocino group? Um, we've got a similar sanctuary up here. I'm on the steering committee for the science part of this. Uh, we've got work in Oregon, we've got work on the East Coast, we've got work in Alaska. Uh, and also British Columbia, that there, everybody's similar kind of problems. We're not alone in all these different issues that we're dealing with. And as you well know, um, actually, it's an international problem. Well, New Zealand, Australia, different places in the world, everybody's got similar kinds of things going on that we need to worry about. So this talk, I hope, kind of puts a little perspective about what we're doing in the state of Washington, putting it in the bigger picture, uh, gives you a little appreciation for kind of the efforts that are going on up here, um, as well as trying to figure out what's going on and working towards a more of a West Coast or international kind of uh, interactions and approaches that we've got here. So with that, uh, I'm gonna, my last slide here is one that, um, it's a quote that I love dearly. Um, a woman named Josephine Tilden from the University of Minnesota came out in 1900 and started the Minnesota Seaside Station at Port Renfrew on the west coast of Vancouver Island, a place called Botanical Beach, and had a marine station there for about six years. And this is a quote from a book that she wrote later on about basically kelp. That, so I'll leave you with that. And I will go ahead and get back into face-to-face um, -face here and answering questions. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. That was a great talk. Now we are going to have time for questions. So if anyone has I'm, one, go I'm ahead. here for the duration. I'm, uh, there's no time limit on me. Being retired Perfect. is great. I don't, I don't have a, <laughs> I don't a Zoom call at five o'clock. Sorry. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So if anyone has a question, you can use the raise hand and then I can unmute you. Okay. Uh, Bobby, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hey, Tom, uh, how's it going? 
Uh, Good. Hope you're doing well. Um, I had a question about some of the stuff going on in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And so I remember we had a talk in Moss Landing when I was there almost a decade ago, which is crazy. Um, but they were talking about the Elwha River Dam removal and all the sediment going into the Strait of Juan de Fuca and how it might affect some of the different populations of kelp there. Mm -hmm. You know, that's in the past, it ended in 2014. Kind of what were the impacts there oh, um, and I, what happened? I could scramble around and probably find you a great slide. For those of you who don't know, um, what happened was that there was um, the major river that drains the majority of the Olympic mountains. It's called the Elwha. And it was dammed in the early 1900s, actually two dams. They didn't even think about salmon at that time. The Elwha was the premier salmon river in the state of Washington. Salmon were gone. And we fought, we fought, we fought. And the dams, after a great deal of commotion, were taken out. I mean, it's been five or six years now, at least. And they took them out all at once, both of them, just knocked them down. And there was this enormous purge of sediment that came out. And Helen Berry, and this was after I retired, so Helen Berry and, and the USGS folks and so forth, carefully have, we've got a long track record of what was there from 89 for a number of years. So we kind of knew what was there. The answer was that the kelp took a hit and the yellowgrass took a real hit because of the turbidity from that. Uh, and, and it took a hit for about three years. And it is now not totally recovered, but it has largely recovered. But the interesting thing of it is now you've got a more normal sediment feed and water hydrology situation than you did before. But the answer is it's, it, it, it took a hit and it came back, okay? I've got, there, there, there's some slides around this. I think if you look, um, let me, I wish I had a slide for that, but I don't, but it, it came back and it's, really, it's, really, it's really been really nice. The other fun thing of it is there's a very large delta that formed with all those sediments that wasn't there before. Okay. So there's some good work on that. Been some really good work. A lot of subtitle uh, surveys done on that. And so they've got, they, get, they did a really nice job of, of, of um, monitoring that. All right, next we have a question from Kristen. So you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, Tom. Um, Hi, Kristen. Great talk, thank you for that. Um, I have a couple of questions just about the kelp restoration projects. Um, the first, I'm just curious about the process, like how long it takes to grow them out to a size when that you can outplant them. And then like, how do you actually like attach them to the bottom? Um, so that's kind of part one. And then part two is, do you have any like preliminary results about like how successful um, the bull kelp restoration projects are, okay. or is it kind of too early to? Um, so they've um, again. This is Puget Sound Restoration Fund that that did did, did, that did this work. Um, I'm speaking secondhand here, um, but they did the sort of normal putting uh, the gametophytes on strings and different kinds of uh, substrate and so forth, and. Put those out in a variety of ways, different different types of things, um, and in about two or three different sites. And to be honest, I think they got in, in some cases, not all. They got growth the first year. To my knowledge, they didn't get any to reproduce and then make a second year. So it's been a it's been a one year bull kelp and, and stop. Okay, thank you. The fun thing. And I, I chuckle about this. In 2013, Brian Allen and I, and I came up with the idea of what is now called green gravel. And Brian tried it, but it was his first attempt ever and he didn't make it work. But we did green gravel <laughs> before anybody else did. Um, and they're, they're trying it again. Uh, this is the idea where you can you can seed the gametophytes on on relatively small gravel, and you instead of putting string and that kind of stuff out, you just scatter the gravel uh, on the bottom with with the uh, young sporophytes on it, and it's worked very well. Uh, the uh, folks in Australia took it, ran with it. Uh, the uh, people in, in Norway and so forth are trying it now; it, it works. 
Very cool. Thank you. Okay, and we have a question from Dan. Hey, Dan. Hi, Tom. Um, I really liked your talk. I've got a bunch of questions. Um, I'm hoping Bennett also has a question or wanted to explain the work that we've been doing here regarding bull cup restoration up in Mendocino. Right, yep. Um, he's also working with uh, Neurocystis in Monterey for his thesis. Right. But, you know, I, I was, the thing I really want to ask first about is the, the Salish Sea and that, and the, the persistence of bull kelp over time and how it's been like disappearing. And I was wondering if you could, if you could talk about the potential for refugia in the, the patches that have persisted and whether or not you know anything about whether that refugia affects both life cycles or just one? <laughs> Good question. So in South Sound, refugia, uh, that, where, they, where they persisted, if you want to call it refugia, have been characterized by areas that have high currents and or high wave action. Okay, Tacoma Narrows, Squaxin Island is this funny little bed way down to the southern one but it has high currents and has very long fetch. So in the wintertime in particular, it's very high wave action, comparatively speaking, in those areas. So as I saw in those pictures, it tends to mix more. And I think you don't get the extremes of temperature and the extremes of, of nutrient um, um, depletion that you do in other places. So I, I, that, that's kind of the refugia question. And I think places like the Tacoma Narrows were gonna, I, I think that's good, it's gonna persist. Squawkson does not look good. They're, they're, it's winking out. And we're frantically running around right now trying to get germplasm gametophytes preserved in culture, you know, try to keep that, that, um, that population going in a zoo, if you will, if you want to call it that. So that answers your question about the refugia. So I want to I wanna take that and I want to sort of push it towards stressors. So I want you to say what you think is not going to be influencing persistence. And I'm thinking you're, you're talking about weight, water motion. Um, I know that they like the exposed coast, uh, at least they do down here relative to macrocystis. Um, and discounting any sort of community effects. I, I'm thinking sedimentation. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it, and whether or not the, the removal of sedimentation due to, due to high, high water motion um, as well as uh, some sort of temperature, and then you you said nutrients. Um, so do 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 you think that like an interaction between those three or any of those any two of those? Uh, That's what could I potentially would start, affect. I, I would start looking at that, but again, I don't I don't have the answer, and I think there's a lot of very good people right now beginning to really dig into that. Um, I, I know of at least three or four people that are all beginning to look at the temperature. But your first, your second part of that question was where in the life history is it, is it going wrong, if you will, is it gametophytes and so forth. We, we really don't understand that. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know of anybody that can put their finger on that. And um, I have a sneaking suspicion that it depends upon where you are also, that it may be in different things in different places. Yeah. The other part that we don't know, we don't, we almost know nothing about is what I'm going to call the chemistry part of this thing. You know, there are all these organic pheromones and so forth in life history. There's um, sensitivity to copper and all these kinds of things in nature, uh, sedimentation, all the kinds of things. It's just, I, I don't think we, we, we know enough. Yeah, especially as the anthropogenic impacts are yeah. you know, increasing. Um, right. There was a well, recent what paper. I, what oh, I've been a proponent of up here, and I haven't figured out how to do it yet. We kind of know when these beds winked out in South Sound, like it was five years ago, it was 10 years ago, it was 20 years ago, it was 100 years ago. Can you go back and look for gametophytes, eDNA kind of stuff, at those sites and see how long those gametophytes might have persisted? Or is it a density? Once they get below a certain density, they're, they're unable to reproduce. You know? Yeah, you I, was gonna, I was just going to say that there's a, there was a recent paper um, uh, just, uh, just published or just accepted um, in JFIC that talked about, mm -hmm. and the, 
let's see, the authors were uh, Schoenrock, uh, McHugh, and then Stacy Kruger Hadfield, and uh, they they can they confirmed the the presence of a seed bank for Alaria and for uh, Neriocystis in the gametophyte stages on rocks in the, in the biofilm itself. Right. So it's I mean it's it's really cool like the potential to to look at all that um, yeah. in a, the future. We got we, we have the tools now. We're beginning to have the tools. Yeah, yeah. We're beginning uh, to have the tools. I, I I'm going to let other people talk, but I do have one more question. Yeah, well, um, so, well, the other the other fun thing to think about a little bit with the other species of kelp is we keep finding those gametophytes in funny places, <laughs> red algae, stipes, different, and they're they're not necessarily on rocks. And I've always been curious, might the limiting factor be coralline algae there or not that supports the gametophytes? If you don't have, you know, is it, is is there not suitable substrate? In terms of uh, settling, or in terms of uh, persisting in an arrested state. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. So you know, there, there lots of. I mean, there's there's, there's years of, of great work, and I, I'm I'm really hoping that you know places like Friday Harbor and. Hopkins and your folks in Moss Landing, you know, this is this is stuff to dig into. This is this is good stuff. It's very relevant, and it's going to be really hard, but rewarding work, I think, to un unravel all this stuff. Okay, I got to ask then. Um, Isenia arborea. <laughs> uh, that's that's a that's a great reaction. I love that. Um, so you had a question mark. Any any observances re recruited in Washington? Yes. Uh, okay. One. What one. Depth? And and it's not is not and it was in the '60s and it's not been found since. What depth? Just subtitle. Okay. Interesting. Have, have are you aware of any? Um, there was not a specimen collected. Okay. Are you no aware of any? Sure it's just a rumor, right? Isn't that what they say? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anecdotal. Um, but, but um, you know, but I I will put money. I would put money on the fact that it is on the outer coast and nobody's seen it because it's not in places that you can get to very easily. Yeah, that's that's where I was going. And my, I, I've seen it on the west coast of Vancouver Island, and it's not very common. It, it's just here and there. Yeah. It, okay. Um, yeah. More to say about that, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I'll... So <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if it's here, but you know. 